Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Sunday morning service of the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of San Miguel de Allende. We are located on the lands of the Chichimeca, Otomi, and Nahuatl people, and are making community by Zoom across Mexico, Canada, and the US. In this vibrant and diverse community, we come together to explore life's intricate tapestry, a tapestry woven with the threads of our dreams, our hopes, and our shared humanity. Each one of us carries within our hearts a thousand prayers and a thousand needs, journeying for a world that is not indifferent to our collective journeys. As we gather in fellowship, we recognize that the answers to our myriad needs are not found in isolation, but in the unity we create when we stand together, shoulder to shoulder. Let us be a beacon of hope and love that banishes indifferences from our world. Let us live and be with one another in a way that radiates this truth, regardless of the challenges and joys each day might bring. We welcome all of you joining us today, wherever you are, whatever your religion's background or lack thereof one is, whichever your race and whoever you love. You can bring your whole self here. My name is Paola Turandot, a member of her communications community and newest board member of her fellowship. I will be your service leader today. After her service, those on Zoom are invited to stay connected and visit with others in the main room. Those who are here with us at La Aldea can join us for coffee and cookies. Now I'm going to check if we have any visitors with here today. If I mention your name, please rise so we can all see you and then come forward with you and say hello at coffee time. We have Janine Cole from Texas. We have George Waterfield. We have Rosita Arvigo from Belize. And we have Peggy Jacobson from Washington State. Do we have any other visitors here today? All right. So um, if we have any other visitors on Zoom, please write your name and we'll uh, personally greet you after the service. Um, we have two important announcements. Next week is our Day of the Dead service and we will have a, our altar here in Aldea. So please bring a photo of your loved ones to put together in the altar. We will receive our annual holiday gift bazaar on December 3rd after your service. If you would like to sell any holiday gifts and donate 20% to our stewardship pledge campaign, please sign up at the information table or see Diana Akisian for that. Thank you. We do record our Sunday services in person. Just go to our website, uufsma.org, and click on the services at the top. Then go to previous services. And while on the website, please check out various events sponsored by the fellowship and information on how to become a member. Now, our minister, Tom Rosiello. Thank you. Good morning. It's a joy to be with you again this morning either in person in this wonderful full room or via Zoom where we have many of our members. Each week as we, we gather, we sense a profound connection to one another. We are reminded that we need one another. In all our diversity, we create again and again a beloved community that centers love, a transformational love that radiates out as compassion, generosity, justice, and equity. We are committed to do this, but we do not always get it right. And therefore, as we gather today, we acknowledge that we are not always our best selves. We fall short of what love demands of us. 
Perhaps that is the central reason why we gather each week, to be called back again and again to our best selves and to the work of creating the ever-changing beloved community. In this time, we call upon the spirit of life, the spirit of love to come unto us, to ground us, and to awaken us to our calling. The flame that we now light is the flame of love, the flame that is rekindled each week in our community. May we feel its presence among us as we now gather in song. I invite you to rise in body or spirit for our opening hymn. It's number 123 in the gray hymnal, Spirit of Life. We will sing it first in Spanish, and the words will appear on the screen, or some of you have it in the front of your hymnal, and then we will sing it, then we'll sing it through in English. And uh, Malcolm and I think Miguel Angel will be helping to lead us in song as well. seated. And now, I invite you to all join together in reciting this fellowship's unique covenant, first in English and then in Spanish. You may rise and bother your spirit. Got it wrong, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, ready? <laughs> we respect the interdependent web of life and work for a just and peaceful world. We encourage the search for truth and meaning, strive for compassion in our relationships, and seek values that will benefit our lives and the lives of others. This is our covenant. Respetamos todos los estilos de vida dentro de su red interdependiente y trabajamos por un mundo justo y pacífico. Alentamos la búsqueda de la verdad y la comprensión total. Nos esforzamos por mantener compasión en nuestras relaciones y buscamos valores que beneficien nuestras vidas y las vidas de los demás. 
Este es nuestro convenio. And now you may sit. <laughs> that was my fault. I, we, I've been doing th services in different places, and everyone does things a little different. So I forgot our, our, uh, our format. We now enter into a very sacred time in our service, a time when members and friends share significant joys, sorrows, and concerns with their community. If you have a joy, sorrow, or concern that you would like me or the person doing joys and concerns to share in a future service, please email it to me, and that information is on the website. If you're with us on Zoom today, you can type any joy, sorrow, or concern into the chat now. I'd like to start this morning on the level of world community. In the past few weeks, it has been difficult for so many of us to process the horrible things happening. War, violence, and hate again this week weigh heavily on our minds. Our hearts are broken as we witness, we see what's happening on the world stage. We're all distressed, we're angered, we're confused. Let's take a moment to be with that and then to light this candle to acknowledge the pain and suffering caused by the horrible attack on Israel. We remember the lives lost and the hostages taken. And in this same candle, we acknowledge the pain of Palestinian people, especially those in Gaza whose lives were lost and the humanitarian crisis that continues to unfold there. Jews, Arabs, Christians, these are all our brothers and sisters. We pray ardently for the safe release of hostages and for the arrival of humanitarian help, especially for the elderly, the children, those innocent people on both sides of the border caught in war. We pray for a path to peace. Again, this week, we light a candle for all those who continue to, a blue candle this time, our blue and yellow one for those who um, continue to be destroyed or lives destroyed or uprooted by another war. The blue and yellow one is for the lives lost, the people injured, the people displaced as a result of the war in Ukraine. And now let's turn to the joy, sorrows, and concerns of our own community. Uh, it's a joy that Ann Geyer, after having had COVID, is tested negative. And I don't know if Ann is back with us here today or... Oh, there you are. Great. Well, it's so wonderful to have you. And with that comes a reminder that we still need to be careful, that there's still COVID out there. And, um, you know, conduct your lives accordingly, please. Um, it's also a joy that this is the time of year where we see people returning to San Miguel. Some of them have been gone for many months and others just for a couple of weeks. I see Francois here. It's also a joy to see Linda Soren here, to see Sydney here. All of you, um, it's great to see your faces gracing our community again. So a welcome back, Kendall. A candle of continued support for the several individuals in our congregation that continue with medical treatment for cancer and other illnesses or injuries. We send them healing thoughts and prayers. You may have names in your heart to hold now. I think of Judy Rosenthal. I think of Kathy Reel's partner, Doug. We also have been asked to light a candle of greater openness of heart for Antonio Gutierrez. That was, let's see if we have any on chat. Let's see if I can come up with that. Where is the, the chat thing isn't there. That's can right. you read? Yeah. Oh, there, it's up to the top, thanks. Yeah. There we go. Thanks. Nothing more on, on chat this, this morning. So we light a final candle 
for all those joys, sorrows, concerns held deep in our hearts but remain unspoken this morning. And we again this week invite you to light a special candle. Perhaps it relates to those suffering in the Middle East right now. Perhaps it relates to something on a personal level. Whatever it is that you hold, please feel free to come forward and silently light a candle as we hear some beautiful music.
So much flows inside of us. It is in this time in the candles we light, the thoughts and prayers that we hold, that we in fact acknowledge all that we feel. Sometimes it's a joy that erupts in us like a fountain or love as vast as the ocean. Sometimes it's pain and grief and sorrow that pierces us like an arrow, can lead us to cry tears like raindrops. Something is always moving in us, and as a beloved community, we acknowledge that we all experience joys, sorrows, concerns, and by sharing them in community, we lessen the pain, we magnify the joy, and we give each other support and strength. We are all in this together, and as we sing of these very human experiences now, we feel the connection to others and to what they are experiencing at this time. And through it all, we seek again and again the peace that flows like a river and strength as mighty as a mountain. Our hymn is number 100 in the gray hymnal. The words will appear on your screen. Please note, you'll see it when it appears on the screen, that there's a little two X at the end of each one. Each verse is sung twice, so you sing it through twice each time. You'll get what we mean, but just don't jump right into the second verse after singing the verse once, because it goes through twice, okay? And if you want to follow the notes and the music, you'll also see that marked as the repeated ending. It's hymn number 100. Malcolm and Mauro and Miguel, you're going to join us too, or you, you want to come up? And, okay, okay. He'll be joining us as well. So please rise as you're able in body or spirit and join us in... I've got peace like a river. Hey. 
water dripping here. <laughs> Yeah, we've got a little water dripping. That's okay. This morning I want to share with you a story. It's actually the best known Bible story according to commentators. It's found in the book of Genesis chapters 5 through 9. It's the story of Noah's Ark. It's a story about a very old man, supposedly 600 years old if you read the text. A good man, but most of the people in that community at that time were not good people. So God told Noah that a great flood was coming and would destroy the evil people, but God gave Noah a plan to save himself and his family and the animal species. He told Noah to build a great boat, an ark. It was not raining at all, but nonetheless, Noah began constructing the ark and worked persistently on it. Everyone thought he was crazy, but that didn't deter him. Noah and his family, as instructed by God, went out to round up animals, two of every species, and they got them on the ark. The rain came and they closed the doors of the ark and the windows. It rained for 40 days and 40 nights. Soon the water lifted the ark and there was so much rain that even the highest mountaintops were covered. After the rain stopped, the ark and its inhabitants floated on the waters for months. When they looked out of the ark, all they saw was water. Finally, they opened a window and let a bird fly out over the water. The bird came back with an olive branch in its beak and a rainbow appeared in the sky indicating that the flood was over, the waters receding, and dry land was returning so that soon they would be able to leave the ark and all would be well. Now, we come together to take the offering we invite you to participate in this sacred act of honoring our collective responsibility toward the common good. Your contributions, no matter how great or small, carry the potential to ignite positive change to make a difference from our community and will be gratefully received. As a child, the story of Noah's Ark was of great appeal to me. I built a model ark and I collected representations of it, like this one here 
It's on the pulpit, done by some amazing Guatemalan women artists. When I was very small, it was first and foremost a story about saving animals. My first dog was one we rescued from a snowbank on a freezing December day in Massachusetts. I was always finding wounded animals, and my mother would help me to try and nurse them back to health. Sometimes we would succeed in saving an injured bird or a squirrel, but if we did not, we would give them a decent and respectful burial. Those were the first memorial services that I conducted. <laughs> you think I might have gotten the idea that I was supposed to be a minister a little earlier than I did. For me back then, Noah was a kind old man who loved animals, and because God had asked him to save the, all those animals, even the snakes and the scorpions, God had to be a real animal lover too, I thought. This is what the story of Noah's Ark meant to me at the age of five or six. And even though I'd heard the whole story, the part about the angry God that destroyed the people and all the life except those which made it onto the Ark, seemed of little importance. It just was not the part of the story that I connected with at that age. As I got a little older and I learned more about animals, how cats chase mice and dogs chase cats and how furious lions can devour other animals, I began to think about all of them living together on one boat for all that time. About how, at least in my coloring book, they all seemed to get along. It was my version of the peaceable kingdom where the lion would lie down with the lamb. There was so much diversity on the ark, yet they all got along. Nowhere in the story does it ever talk about the animals fighting. At some point, the lesson of life on the ark became a teaching about how people should live together. A lot of very different people can come together with a common purpose. They do not have to fight. One did not have to dominate over another but they could all, in fact, live together in peace. Well, also, there was such suspense for me in the story, just floating all that time in the water and 40 days of rains and months of floating. Would they ever find land? And then there was the little bird that brought the good news. You know, it reminded me of springtime in New England where the robins, every spring without fail, brought us the good news that Life is returning to the frozen and drab landscape. Somehow the birds that return to us every spring seem to be forming the same mission that that little bird with the olive branch did for Noah. They bring hope that new life is just around the corner. Now, if you were to ask me, was my childhood analysis in conformity with the scholarly understanding of what the central theological teachings of this sacred scripture are? I guess I'd have to say no. Certainly orthodox theologians would say I had missed the central message altogether. This was a story about an angry God who punished evil people by drowning every one of them and saving just a select few good people. The animals which seemed so central to me as a child were just kind of extras in the story. Well, as a Unitarian Universalist minister, I'm certainly not required to preach on biblical stories at all. So why am I doing so? Well, I think that when we ignore ancient texts with stories like this, we miss a profound opportunity. It is a way to engage with others for whom those texts are central to their faith and life, and also for, to engage going back for many of us that grew up with these stories to re-engage with them again. It gives us a common starting point for discussion. We can share the story, but still take away a different meaning. By the way, just parent to the side, a very similar story of a great flood with bad people being destroyed and an ark being built to save the good people and the animals is found in many ancient cultures. Perhaps some of you have heard the story of Gilgamesh. It's very, very similar. 
It comes from the ancient Babylonian or Mesopotamian culture. It has many of the very same elements of the Jewish story of Noah. There's a universality in these shared stories from ancient times, stories familiar to many of us, a common starting point, as I said, from which we can explore different meanings, meanings giving legitimacy to some because they draw on the same story. Now, I'm glad that in our tradition, we're not required to take one interpretation of a biblical story. You know, what makes a story great and lasting is that it's rich in a variety of meanings. Perhaps one meaning when you're a child and another when you're older. And even as adults, a good story is one that we can read or tell again and again and find new things each time. I think, did you ever notice how children love to have their favorite story read again and again and again? You know, I don't think that they're just getting the very same thing out of it every time. At least with my little ones that I've worked with, they ask different questions. They have different thoughts each time they hear it. They're open to a variety of meanings that we as adults often are not. As adults, we sometimes lose our imagination, our willingness to engage with a story. Perhaps we say, I don't believe in a God of anger and vengeance, and therefore quickly toss out the story, toss this, let's say, toss the story of Noah overboard. <laughs> or we say, I believe in evolution, therefore there's nothing for me to learn from the Genesis story of creation. We don't believe in the story of the, the burning bush or the Red Sea parting, and therefore the story of Moses is out. Or instead, we try to analyze the story with a scientific mind. We learn, for example, that there are plants which will spontaneously combust and burn slowly under certain conditions, and that the years of drought might have made it possible to cross the Red Sea on foot. We've all probably seen this way of, of approaching biblical stories on NPR specials or the history or the science channels. I have to admit, I find those programs engaging. And I wonder why. Is it because we want some of those stories to be true to scientific standards? Our 21st century minds seem to think that if we can show a, a story true scientifically, then it's more important, more meaningful. And yes, the story of Noah's Ark has had more than one attempt to offer scientific verifications. A few years ago, I turned on the TV and there was a report on the news that someone flying a plane over the highest mountain in Turkey had spotted what they claimed was Noah's Ark. And this has been claimed other times before. And once again, it led to a discussion among commentators whether this could be the actual Ark. The usual experts were called to give some scientific babble and everyone's attention was drawn to the possibility that the story might really be true. It seems that we want the stories to be true from a scientific perspective, much more than we want to engage with the truth of the story. We think of ourselves as intelligent because we engage these stories through the rational lens of science. Now, I'm not putting down science for a minute and the many lessons science has to teach us, but our efforts to scientifically prove or disprove biblical stories really does not take us to the truth of these stories. For me, those folks who try to do this have missed the critical aspect of engaging any story from any great religious tradition. One of my colleagues used to say, just because something isn't true does not mean that I do not believe it. <laughs> These stories have survived because they contain truth or truths, not because they are true. But we read them with eyes of suspicion rather than imagination. We distance them rather than engage with them. I believe it's sad and frankly inconsistent with what we say we do as Unitarian Universalists, which is to engage in the search for truth and meaning with open minds 
When we do engage the great stories of scripture with imagination and open mind, we'll take away something meaningful for sure. At whatever stage of life and faith development we're at, it may not be the message that the author intended, but who really knows? We don't have to reconcile every part of the story. We don't have to sanitize it so every aspect of it fits within our own theology. What I hope Unitarian Universalists and others will do is become more religiously literate with the stories and then make their own meaning. These stories are a common part of our culture and we should engage with them and not avoid them. When I was at Harvard Divinity School, I had the privilege of studying preaching with a really great man, the retired Episcopal Bishop from New Jersey, John Shelby Spong. Some of you have read m many of his books. Most of the folks in this really rather exclusive preaching seminar already had quite a bit of preaching experience. And frankly, they were ready to show off their stuff to one of the country's most renowned and controversial preachers. However, he immediately threw us a curveball. The first assignment he gave us was to find the story or the passage in scripture that you most disbelieve, most dislike, and that's the topic for your sermon. <laughs> Mine it for the meaning that you can make from it, just because it's there and it's part of that cultural language. I worry we as Unitarian Universalists don't do enough things like that. We think of ourselves as so advanced that we don't allow ourselves to find the kind of truth that religions have always taught. The kind that comes from going deeper and deeper into the stories and looking at those stories with new eyes. A while back, I ran across a list of 10 lessons that that great author we all know, Anonymous, drew from the story of Noah. And I'd like to share them with you. Some are kind of silly, but others I think might be right on point for where you're at in life or where this fellowship is at, the opportunities and challenges it faces. I'm willing to bet at least one of these teachings will resonate with you and that when you again at some time hear the story of Noah's Ark, that's what's gonna come to mind. Ms. or Mr. Anonymous, open this article with this broad assertion. Everything I need to know I learned from the story of Noah's Ark. Really? Well, you know where the title of the sermon came from. I'll let you be the judge if that's true at all as I go th through some of the, all of the items on the list. The first lesson he or she drew from that ancient story was, don't miss the boat. <laughs> That jumped out for me. As I thought about the wonderful point of opportunity where this fellowship is at, opportunity to grow, to do so in a multicultural and even bilingual way. And in so many things in life, we procrastinate. We wanna talk about it more and more. Unitarian Universalists love to talk more and more about all things. The water is rising. We have to decide if we want to get on the boat and there are consequences if we miss the boat. And what about the boat? The second lesson the author draws out of the story is, remember, we are all in the same boat. That might actually be the most important lesson of all. Those diverse animals did not fight in the story did not devour each other in the story. This is the message of both beloved community and interdependence. Each of us is not an island unto ourselves. It's not about me, 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 or my group within the larger group. It's about us, us as a whole, a congregation, doing things together. Sometimes it can be a bit difficult, but we are all in the same boat. The next lesson the author drew from the story was plan ahead. It wasn't raining when Noah built the ark. <laughs> Recently, 
as I've been meeting with the board and other committees that are working on our new foundation and on our minister and residence project and on our budget, the importance of this teaching comes to mind over and over again. It seems to go right along with that first lesson of don't miss the boat. We as a community need to get this process going. Our fellowship is in an exciting and critical time in its history, and we need to seize the moment. And that leads to the next life lesson from the story of Noah. Build your future on high ground, <laughs> on high moral principles, on a solid financial foundation, not just for us now, but for the generations that come later. And now if you are one of our many active 80 plus year olds, and there are many of you, you might instantly connect with Noah being a very active old man. And that goes to the fifth lesson the anonymous writer drew from the story. Stay fit. When you're very old, someone may ask you to do something really big. <laughs> and if of late, you have recently been attacked for what you were trying to do, maybe here in this fellowship or in some other organization, Maybe you've received some harsh criticism. Perhaps the sixth lesson from the ancient story will speak to you. Don't listen to critics. Just go on with the job that needs to be done. And the author then lists a couple of reminders that seem universally true. For safety's sake, travel in pairs. <laughs> and one we perhaps remember from the famous story of the tortoise and the hare. Speed isn't always an advantage. The snails were on board with the cheetahs. <laughs> and perhaps if you're stressed or burnt out, as I know some of you are, the next lesson from the story might really speak to you. That is, when you are stressed, float for a while. Those months of just floating around on the ark provide a break, a time to regain strength for what's coming next. The last lesson the anonymous author draws from the story is in his or her words, remember the ark was built by an amateur, the Titanic by professionals. <laughs> That reminded me that we can do what we need to do. We have the resources. Of course, we will continue to need professional help, but we have great amateurs too, with extraordinary skills who can lead the way. Well, you might say that we're pretty far away from the biblical story of Noah, and maybe you're right. But I hope perhaps you heard the story in a new way today and maybe found some part of that story which you'd never thought of before meaningful to you. This sermon is really not about engagement with the story of Noah. It is an invitation to visit ancient texts and ancient stories with new eyes. But it's, uh, but it's a way of saying we need to let go of some of our 21st century pre prejudices and bring ourselves to those old stories with fresh eyes. You know, in the next few months, I'm gonna do this a couple of times with a couple other aging stories. And frankly, I enjoy the discipline. And I find it connects us to a broader world religious perspective. It even connects us, many of us, with our own roots, having heard these stories as children. But with a freedom to do so that most religious traditions, unfortunately, do not enjoy. I hope you'll agree with that. Just because one part of your brain thinks a story isn't true does not mean that at another level you should not embrace it, believe it, and mine it for the truth that you can find in it. I hope you do find that, don't find this sermon too silly, too much of a Silly exercise, if you will, and I hope you'll give the practice a try. Thanks.
You'll notice I messed up the order of service today, but all worked out just fine. <laughs> and thank you, thank you very much for being with us today in person. And also thank you, Mauro, not just for the beautiful music, but for educating us about some wonderful Mexican musical, musical history. Uh, also, next week, I hope you'll join. Next week is the Day of the Dead service, am I correct? Yes. I know Carla and Paola will be, will be creating our altar and will be offering a reflection. Um, and also, you will want to, if you haven't already got tickets to the Day of the Dead concert, Mara will be conducting the chorale. It'll be about 65 singers, I think, at the San Francisco church. We'll be out of town and sad to miss it. But there's still tickets available. You can get them from Mara today. Or there's also a, a free concert later in the day if you can't afford the ticket or if you know people in the Mexican community who would like to benefit. I would suggest the last time we did this, the line was forever. So if you're going to try for the free, we get there early. But if you want to talk tomorrow about either one, he's, he'll be here after this service. You know, we meet in troubled times in so many ways. Yet we have so much to be grateful for. The 13th century German theologian, philosopher, mystic Meister Eckhart once said, if the only prayer you ever said was thank you, that would be enough. We leave this service this morning by together expressing our gratitude for the many blessings of life. Life in this community, life here in San Miguel. And let us do so together in song. Gracias por el amor. The words will appear on the screen. Um, it's from our Spanish hymnal, which we don't have copies of, but you'll see the words as they appear there. This morning, when we lit our chalice, we reminded ourselves that at the center of our faith tradition is love. And it is the flame of love that we reignite each week. Now we extinguish the flame, but we carry the love with us. And may that love which overcomes all differences, which heals all wounds, which puts to flight all fears, which reconciles all who are separated, be in us and among us, now and always. Amen. <laughs>